guys, it's Andrea from Nebulin for a great conversations around the NDIS. So guys, first up, just a bit of housekeeping. The community pharmacist I was going to record with um, is onboarding some new staff, so he sends his apologies. But guys, it is winter, and can we, when he records with me, definitely show him some love in the comments section as well. And if you're in the Toowoomba area, I would encourage you when he discloses his store to support him as well. Because guys, being an ex-pharmacy assistant and person who worked in that industry, guys, going with a mum and pop store is definitely the way to go for the simple reason that consistency of care, especially for someone with a disability, is amazing so as well so guys so let's jump into it today is just tying a few ends together so first thing is we've talked about grooming with a disability but guys this one is based on my experiences of being able to work with support workers and other services so guys over on youtube i did a video and i want to expand on it here about it takes time and support and it really does and one of the biggest factors and it's not the only factor is you may not be used to having support the support worker may be new to the industry as well and guys this is something that i've seen happen time and time and time again is that support worker will start off with an agency get pissed off that they can't achieve what they want to do with the client set up an independent business and discover that the agencies have got a anti-pinching clauses which is fair enough and b they will discover why they were hamstrung by the agency is because of rules and regulations around disability or laws around disability care or even familiar relationships. So that would be parents. And guys, I think for an adult with a disability, it's kind of an interesting and very nuanced topic to talk about is how involved a parent should be so parent i think that there is such a thing as an over involved parent who is stifling their child but then there is parents who are not involved enough as well so Guys, that's the first thing as well. Getting to know the client, getting to know their routine is a huge one. Or even getting them into a routine. Because I know that was the huge thing for me of figuring out what a support worker could and couldn't do. And guys, even within the first agency that I went with, which was one of the big box agencies around my town, it was there was a huge discrepancy between what support workers could do because of their injury, their own disabilities, their own background. So guys, if you can control your own disabilities and diversities, great. But if you can't, I would cons um, say consider another industry, maybe peer support or advocacy. Not saying that people with a disability don't make excellent support workers, they do. But you need to remember that it's not about you. And that's the next thing, is that learn the hard way that it is not about you. Support workers have a bad day, they are human as well. So giving them a bit of grace and understanding is huge, but they are there to do a job. And that's the thing, we've got to remember that you can be friendly with a support worker or community nurse or 
other forms of caregiver as well. But if they are paid, they're not paid to be your friend. Um, this is something that, that I've seen as well, is that people think, oh, they can train up a friend or a family member to be a support worker because they're providing, providing what the NDIS call informal support. I have seen so many people fall into that trap and realise that, no, the whole point of having a support worker is it's someone who's separated from the family to let the family be a family. And let's be honest, not all families are healthy. So definitely go and check out Alex Ferdinand's one about family dynamics. Not sure what podcast it is, but oh my God, she is amazing. She's a neuropsychiatrist, I believe. Um, and she has the podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? Um, absolutely amazing podcast as well. And the other one I have recently discovered is The Brain Food Show, hosted by Simon Whistler and Davin, one of his writers for his other channels as well. And that's the other thing is um, being able to self-advocate and understand the difference between self-advocating and being a nuisance is huge. Knowing time and place is huge because I'm seeing over on TikTok some disability advocates who are that the Royal Commission is not implementing every that the government is not accepting every suggestion from the Disability Royal Commission and some of the decisions I can understand some I can't but one that's fairly controversial, it was going to be fairly controversial, was closing special schools to end segregation. But a lot of parents of medically complex um, children of profound disabilities were like, this is not going to end well for able-bodied children who need an education as well. Um, so guys, there is actually a time and a place for specialised places for people with a disability, whether that be a special school, whether that be like a general special school, school for the blind, school for the deaf. When they're taught specialised skills, that might be braille, that might be orientation and mobility training, that might be specialised therapies that might be working with a positive behaviour practitioner to have emotional regulation for someone with heightened emo emotions. And guys, the other thing that I'm seeing is, I run TikTok, is a lot of people who are going to a doctor for an autism or an ADHD assessment and getting annoyed when they don't get the diagnosis and then they're going to another doctor and then they're surprised when a when they're told that they can't go to another doctor they're like but i want this diagnosis guys there is something called doctor shopping it's more around shopping for certain medications as well but doctor shopping for a diagnosis is also a very real thing as well. So, guys, that is huge as well. So, and guys, I say this with a lot of love and compassion, but I do think we are over pathologizing life. Everyone seems to have a diagnosis these days. And that then dilutes the power of those diagnosis as well and the self-diagnosed community <sighs> guys i understand in america in places without the universal care system and even in australia where the waiting lists are huge self-diagnosis might be a great idea but 
the framework around it. I feel it's a lot more polite to say I suspect I have it rather than just saying, oh, I have it because without a doctor's diagnosis as well because I'm seeing a lot of the self-diagnosed community are turning what is a debilitating mental illness or neurodiversity into essentially a character trait, quirky, stereotypical character traits. So guys, this is where I'm like, oh, can people please stop it as well? Um, guys, that also then comes back to respect. And respect is something I've had to learn as well. So knowing the difference between gossip and information sharing and knowing that sometimes there's a reason that support staff or housing managers can't do something as well or they might be hamstrung by real estate agents, um, housing managers, NDIS guidelines as well. And so that's the thing. Um, I'm on a huge push to have people with a disability have a bit of gratitude, um, especially in Australia where we are so blessed to have universal care, um, clean water. We are free from conflict as well. So, guys... It is amazing the amount of people on other platforms I see whinging that they don't have everything that opens and shuts. And my perspective, and guys, I know this is going to be hot take, but my perspective is that we really should have a bit of gratitude for what we do have. I'm not saying the toxic positivity of Helena of everything's fine. Everything's not fine, but it's never going to be perfect. And that is part of the human condition as well. And that's where I'm like, okay, we can have a bit of gratitude that you had someone who was able to help you get up this morning, help you make breakfast, help you get to a day centre or a workplace or um, your hobbies if you're going out of the house. So that is huge as well um and guys this is the other thing is if you help dressing a client giving them that dignity of choice it may be pulling two options out of the cupboard um for a female do they want to wear dress or pants or for a male depending on the weather do they want to wear jeans or pants and encouraging them to dress smartly as well. Presenting yourself with a disability is, presenting yourself well is not hard. It can be hard for someone to learn the skill of what goes with what and to dress for the weather. But this is the thing, if you're dressing someone and having a level of control over their clothes, having a bit of pride in them and advocating for them as well but that's the thing there's got to be a level of choice and the other thing is a level of respect for their where they live so guys quite recently in our unit block um the landlord has put no smoking signs up on the premises um because there are some support workers who were not respecting that as well. So this is the thing of respecting the client's values around smoking. And guys, from an ex-community pharmacy assistant, so pharmacy assistants, um, that there is plenty of help out there for you to stop smoking, to stop vaping as well. So... Guys, nicotine is an interesting addictive drug and the amount of chemicals stuff in vapes and smokes are not doing you 
any good. So, guys, if you talk to a pharmacist, your doctor, there's patches, there's gum, there's plenty of help out there as well. And, guys, just by quitting, the amount of money you save as well. So, quitting alcohol is other, another huge one as well. But, guys, I know that the guidelines are one or two drinks a week. Um, I know other countries have said straight out that there is no safe limit for alcohol um, as well. But that's another thing that support workers need to respect. But if they have addictive personalities, it's really difficult to manage as well because you don't want to put a support worker and the support workers don't want to put themselves in a situation where that client's going to give them harm or harm themselves. And that's verbal abuse, that might be physical abuse, that might be throwing up as well. And so that's a huge one to be aware of as well. But guys, having a bit of gratitude. And so what does gratitude look like? It can be physically having a gratitude journal of I am grateful for. And guys, a few prompts is being grateful for potable water, for hot water, for clean clothes, for support, for being able to move if you're a mobility aid user for that mobility aid it sounds stupid but being able to move independently whether that be a zimmer frame a wheelie walker a wheelchair a powered wheelchair um, a mobility scooter that represents freedom for so many people freedom and independence and independence is going to look different for everyone generally for me it's running the youtube the blog and the podcast as well as volunteering with some organizations that i volunteer for going to the day center and being able to exercise as well and the other thing that i'm being a real real advocate for at the moment is having offline hobbies so uh, they don't they don't have to be expensive um, as well and guys it could be Pokemon trading cards it could be basketball trading cards it could be jigsaw puzzles I sew and paint watercolors it could be cooking it could be bushwalking it could be photography um, all things that build skills as well. So guys, um, that's the thing. Support workers have got a lot of care, but they don't have a lot of responsibility, but a lot of accountability. Guys, see you on the other side. So guys, I had a visitor, which was great. And now this is the other thing I want to talk about is respect. And why it can take time is that knowing visitor etiquette, whether you're visiting with a client, going over to someone else's house, whether you're going into someone else's home, or even teaching them visiting etiquette, that can be huge because a lot of people, due to the pandemic, due to their types of disabilities may not have been taught visiting etiquette. It's very different to when my friends come over, they'll bring something or I'll offer something, which is very different to when the parentals will come over as well. And guys, that's the other thing is that Relationships with parents and guides as a support worker, best thing you can do is encourage healthy 
relationship with the clients, family and friends. I'm going to freely admit that not all relationships within families are healthy. But it's not your judge to judge unless there is standing non-contact orders as well. But helping them to process what type of relationship they have understanding healthy relationships and healthy boundaries and understanding that people are allowed to be upset if you put a boundary around them as well so guys i know this has been a bit of a disjointed episode as well but i think it is a conversation that we need to have that we can't expect miracles overnight and it's because a support worker might be new to the industry it might be they don't have the skills needed for the industry but you can learn on the job they may have the right end attitude and that's the thing so many people come into this industry thinking it's all about taking a client to appointments, shopping, a bit of housework. It is a lot more involved than that. Um, I do know Tammy the Recruiter over on TikTok did a really informative video and shout out to her as well. And she was saying, Google what personal care is. So for those who don't have time to Google, let me explain it for you. Personal care, it's exactly like it sounds like you're showering someone, you're bathing them, you're washing their hair, both genders and children as well. You may be taking them to the toilet, you may be changing incontinence aids, both for urine and feces. You might be picking kids up from school or TAFE. Though, that's an interesting one. That can come under parental responsibility. You may be cooking the meals. You may be doing the ironing as well. So, guys, it is huge as well. So, guys, going to leave it there as well. So, guys, the other places you can find me um, is Annie's Escapade. So the YouTube channel has had a rebrand. So for the simple reason that Annie in Wonderland, How to Experience the NDIS, great name for a blog, not so great name for a YouTube channel. I was coming up on the third page of Google and the fourth page of YouTube as well. So not great for my analytics as well. So that's the other place you can find me over on Blogger is Annie in Wonderland, how to experience NDIS. I think we are in the process of getting it all to Annie in Wonderland. Um, Annie in Wonderland on YouTube is already taken. So YouTube is Annie's Escapades, but on Blogger it's Annie in Wonderland, as well as Andrea Nunn on TikTok though I'm not posting to TikTok as much because TikTok was starting to affect my mental health so guys um if you want to wish Deb well wishes she is struggling with winter logies at the moment and guys definitely email us um it's annie nun all lowercase a n n i e dot nun n u double n at one two three four at gmail.com because we'd love to do a mailbag episode and respond to your questions and comments what she does because if you're not in the industry you don't know the difference between a community nurse a support worker a caregiver a um, client liaison officer, a house manager, a main support worker, um, a PA that all have different roles in the industry as well. And guys, 
going to start doing a deep dive into ethics in support and what ethics mean because at the start of the video I did um podcast sorry I did talk about being hamstrung by rules and regulations but what ethics do support workers need to abide by roles and responsibility and their limits of responsibility as well okay guys see you next Tuesday